Today we've got Ermi's Chrysler Chrysler up on the hoist. We've just done an oil filter relocation on it. Now, my relocations are a little bit different to how everyone else does it. I like to do mine out of hard line. Reason why I do it out of hard line is that way there's less chance of any hoses blowing. Well, there's no chance of a hose blowing. But it's a lot more work, a lot harder to do. But the end result is it looks prettier, neater, and it has a better result because you don't have the restriction that you do through a rubber hose or a nylon hose, whichever hose you decide to use. Anyway, the reason why we do an oil filter relocation on these is because originally they locate the oil filter on top of the engine and anyone that owns a Chrysler V8 knows that every time you get to change the oil, the oil drains all over the engine, makes a hell of a mess and you got to clean it and it's just more work that you don't necessarily have to do. Like a lot of people stick rags around them, I do myself, um, but you still get a little bit get past. So this was just a, a better idea. This is, this is how I've always done them. I've been doing them this way for about 15 years now, but not many people have seen it. So I figured we'll show everyone today what the system sort of looks like and, and how it works. But another th reason why you don't want the oil filter to sit on top of the engine is this engine in particular had a, a at least two or three seconds, sometimes less, take before the oil pressure comes up. So you get that n nasty little tick, tick, tick every time it has to pump the lifters up. So now having the oil filter underneath, the oil filter always stays full. It cannot drain back because it's sitting at this a reasonable level with the sump. So anyway, um, another reason why we do the oil filter relocation is because the original valve in the oil lines does have a bad habit of drain back. So, and with drain back, every time you start it again, you get that two or three seconds of um, no oil pressure until it pumps all the oil through the filter in the lines. So you'll be able to have a look at this as I speak. And anyway, um, all my all my lines are stainless. Why stainless? Looks pretty. I could do it out of mild sort of steel or uh, aluminium, but I just like stainless. I reckon it looks pretty and it and it lasts the test of time. And and with the way I've set them up, there's no kinks. It doesn't have to bend. It's no. It's not subject to any engine vibration. So it's not going to be a problem. So that's it. On the way back from the Adelaide 500, we had a little bit of a disaster with my car. So we were driving along, Shane and I like to push this thing and before we left to head to the Adelaide 500, we actually increased the rev limit on her to 6,200 RPM. Um, this motor has, it's it was rebuilt, it's a stroker, it had cam upgrade but we were still running pretty much the standard rods and hypertectic pistons and we had in it one of the first nodular iron Mopar performance stroker cranks and that crank had been punished and had done a lot of kilometres so we made it to just outside border town Shane mentioned that he didn't think it sounded right I couldn't really hear it because we had the windows down and there was a lot of road noise and Alan and Emily were just sort of yelling at each other and cruising along. Um, it still felt all right. Uh, there's footage of it driving past and it seemed to sound all right in the footage as well. Then we went to the next stop and we're driving along and I'm following Shane who was towing war score and all of a sudden I felt a power loss. So immediately I backed off. Um, checked all the gauges, no oil lights were on, no warning lights were on, nothing. So, and I check all the gauges as we're going along anyway. So I've had Alan call Shane, say, right, we need to pull over. Pulled in at the next servo, and I just sort of rolled her in. I didn't accelerate anymore. It was a good downhill run, and I had enough momentum. And what we didn't know at the time was that the rear of this crank had just fatigued and aged, and it had cracks in it that you couldn't see with the naked eye and it had started to grab on the rear main bearing so that caused it to overheat which caused the rear 
night seal to fail, which caused me to lose a lot of oil. And we're talking a lot of oil. So the oil light didn't come in until I idled into the servo. It came in, turned it off straight away. Probably shouldn't have turned it off because that caused the rear main seal to sort of melt onto the crank's surface. And when I started it again, it just ripped the rear main seal to shreds. So we made a little bit further, pulled into the next, topped her up with oil, made it a little bit further, pulled into the next servo, realized I was losing stupid amounts of oil and it was a bit too dangerous for anybody else that would have been driving or riding behind me. So it was decided that she was going on a tow truck and coming home. Luckily, I backed off when I felt something was wrong and there wasn't complete and utter catastrophic failure and cranks getting broken and pistons failing. So we put it up on the hoist and drained the oil out what oil was left because we put oil in it we put two liters of oil in it and it within 20 k's it was gone again so it just seemed to self-level at, at, at about three liters of engine oil which is no good so anyway um we pulled the sump off pulled the drag link, drag link off and started pulling bearings apart trying to find out what was wrong because you couldn't physically see anything wrong by by the eye and when I pulled the rear main off, I went, wow, it was black, like black as black could be. And it had got that hot that the bearing material had started to pass its way under the crankshaft. Didn't spin a bearing, which was amazing because normally when you get something like that happen, it spins a bearing. But it didn't spin the bearing, but it had created so much heat that it actually shrunk the rear main by um, two thou. So what we had to do is we had to, um, we tried to put another set of bearings in it, but that was futile. You couldn't physically see that there was an issue with the rear main, so I just bought another set of bearings and thought after cleaning the crankshaft up, and we cleaned the crank and it come up beautiful. Went to, we didn't realize it was a problem until we went to slide in a new set of bearings, and that's when we realized something was seriously wrong because they just physically wouldn't go in. So what I did is I put a dial indicator on the end of the crank and as I spun the, or actually Ermi spun, we put a dial indicator on the end of the crank. Ermi spun the engine over while I watched the dial indicator and that's when we realized that um, it was deflecting by one and a half thou, the crank, so it was oscillating around. So that's what made us decide, well, the engine's coming out. So when we pulled it out, we took the crankshaft down to Charlie Saliba's. Charlie put it through his little crack tester because he, 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 he was pretty sure it was cracked. And sure enough, it was cracked. So that was the end of that crankshaft. So, well, we decided that we'd give it a little bit of a birthday and we'd replace everything with high quality parts because it had factory rods, even though they were uh, smooth and shot peened. And we had high-protective pistons, which are good street sort of style piston. We decided, let's go forgies. So we went forge pistons and we raised the compressor ratio from 9.7, which is what it was, to 10.7. So, and also too with a new steel crank. So we got a um, good set of H-beam uh, rods, scat rods, and a scat steel crank. So that way we didn't have to worry about any thing going wrong in the future because the internals were good enough to handle what we've built here even though it's still got cast iron heads and cast iron intake manifold she puts out a reasonable amount of power so and we didn't want to well we didn't want to waste our time buying another nodular iron crank again and it only lasts another 250,000 so so we wanted it to last a bit longer than that so we went for the good quality stuff. Even though we'd done 250,000 miles on the engine, when we checked the engine bores, the engine bores were like brand new. They had half a thou of wear. And I put that down to good regular oil changes and, and good quality machining by Charlie. So, and it's been fantastic sort of ever, ever since. It's been great, so, but um, yeah, so, Basically what we did is we pulled all the bottom end apart, rehoned the bores, 
lined board the crank uh, main tunnel, had the uh, the bottom end balanced and just reassembled her. So she's basically the same combination, same cam shaft and everything. But we have done a couple of extra upgrades. Our uh, our buddy's a pacemaker. We've got a, a a bigger set of headers now. So we've got the headers that go down to three inch. So they're a bigger primary and bigger secondaries into the um, collector, three inch collector. So, and now we've upgraded the exhaust system to three inch. And the reason why we went to three inch is because we noticed the last time we ran it on the dyno, it tended to drop off in power once it reached um, a certain RPM quite rapidly. So that's a good telltale sign that the exhaust just isn't big enough. So, and everything that you, you look up on the internet and, and talk to people about it, they'll tell you anything that's pushing around the 500 flywheel power should have um, and the cubic capacity should have at least dual three inch so and that's what we've done so but we're just taking it easy we've got the engine back in we've run it we've got the timing a little bit retarded it's running really hot in the pipes at the moment they're 680 degrees fahrenheit which tells me it's really retarded so i'm going to put a bit more timing into it just to try and keep the engine happy and um, then we'll take it for a bit of a test drive up through the mountains and, and put a bit of an edge on the rings. The other thing we're going to do before we drive this up to Albury is regas the air conditioning mm. so that we can drive with the windows closed and actually maybe hear when something goes wrong. Because yeah. at 110 kilometres per hour in a 35 degree day with all four windows down, it's it's a lot of buffering noise. Yeah. So Alan and I were yelling at each other to hear each other in the front seat. So the aircon's going to be regassed. Um, Shane gets to drive her in up through the mountains. And yeah, it's just this motor's now been built that many times. It looks like I've smoothed the block. <laughs> so, <laughs> it looks um, lovely. Like it looks fantastic. So, so. but it's. I think it was more work. Well, we paint off the block than it was for me to build the thing again. Well, we so, re well, we relocated the oil filter as well because we were sick and tired of the oil pouring down the back of the engine. So, and um, <clears throat> so the oil filter housing at the top is just there to make it look stock. Yeah, and Shane did a fantastic job. When you relocate the oil filter housing with it sitting upside down, it's actually keeping the oil in the filter instead of draining it back down. Yeah, that was the biggest issue with these engines. They even though they've got a uh, one-way valve in the in the um, adapter in the housing, they still suffer from drain back, and and when it drains back into the sump, it's just you know. Then every time you start it, the thing ticks its head off. Many Chryslers you hear them; they, they're at a car show or something, and they start up, and they tick, 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 and then the tick goes they away. They keep good time when they start up. They're yeah, yeah, yeah. and it's just it. a bit embarrassing. So we got rid of that. Now she just starts and runs. We did do one other thing in the head combo because we, we did two other things. We changed the head gaskets. Yeah, we went to Comedic because when we, when we checked the head gaskets, we actually found they were leaking. They were leaking compression yeah. and they were leaking water. Just a little bit. Just and a little it is bit. something that had just started. So mm. that would have been next. That yeah. would have gone, yeah. definitely. Um, but we also did something else with the roller rocker. So, we change the ratio. Yes. Yeah, so, so we lots had of one. Sneaky stuff. Yeah, we had 1.5s. <laughs> we couldn't go any higher than 1.5 because of our pistons. So, but now that we got big valve reliefs in the pistons, we've changed the rocker ratio. So now we've got 600 lift. So only on the exhaust. We left the intake because the intake efficiency wasn't didn't wasn't make. Issue. Well, it didn't make a difference. Yeah. And if you're gonna. If you're going to raise your intake um, lift to 600 thou, or oh, would have been 600, or oh, would have been 595, I think yeah, it was. It was close. Yeah. Would have been 595 on intake, and if we had have had 595 on intake, it wouldn't have made a difference. All it would have done is put extra uh, pressure on the valve train, and I'm not interested in doing that. I'd rather make more power. So at least that way it improves scavenging by having 600 lift in the exhaust. These um, J heads, even though these heads are extremely ported, they're really a bad design head and they have a lot of dead spots 
Um, so for flow, but Sorry. we've done the best we can with anything what we've got. we can do to help these heads flow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're doing. That's right. So, yeah. yeah, yes. So yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how she goes. We've got some tuning to do. Where? What's today? Today's Tuesday. We've got one week, one day to go. Mm. This is car number two down that we needed to get ready for Chrysler's on the morrow. So we've got Frank and Charge done. This one will need some tuning. We're going to finish the VF. We're, We're going to finish, put some chassis rail connectors in the VF and yep. a whole list of work to get the VG 90% there yep. for Chrysler's on the Murray. So it'll be interesting. Mm, very interesting. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to click like and leave a comment below. If you want to see more videos like this one, subscribe and click the notification bell so that it lets you know when we've popped up a new video. And if you reckon the merch that the crew at Belly Grunt's wearing is pretty cool and would like to get some for yourself, then click on the link in the description. See you next time.